was from Bukulu later on, uh, one was sent to India, and had been, uh, it had been a house pet of William Farquhar, and he, there's a story about Farquhar feeding it from his own, <laughs> his own dish. He loved this type here for some reason. Uh, so it was Farquhar's pet. So Horsfield stayed in Java until Raffles went to Bukulu. So he was there for 17 years, and then he moved to Bukulu in June 1818, and then he went up to Pada to explore the Minan Highlands, in 1819, he moved back to England, when Raffles, of course, was still in Sumatra, to explore the, uh, or sorry, and uh, he wrote his magnum opus, Zoological Researches, published in parts between 1821 and 24, and it has been reprinted, the whole thing. And we, I think we have a launch here in the National Library, if I'm not mistaken. One of his sketchbooks and some others of his uh, drawings are also in the India Office Library. So he went to, uh, uh, London became the keeper of the Indian Museum, which was in Leadenhall Street, which is where the East India Company's headquarters were. And uh, by the 1840s, the museum was getting over 20,000 visitors a year, not bad for that period. Um, there weren't many museums in London yet at this time. And one of his visitors was Alfred, was Alfred Russell Wallace. This is before he explored the East uh, Archipelago, the Malay Archipelago, as he called it. So Wallace was influenced by what he saw in um, the Horsefield Museum. He died in London in 1859, apparently never went back to Philadelphia, uh, left a wife and two children. Um, these are some more of his drawings of a bathing place in East Java. Not quite sure which one it is. Okay, so that brings up to date on some of Raffles' important staff, and he had a lot of these very good people working with him. So obviously he didn't do all the work himself, but he had very good uh, experience of people along with him. Uh, so 1811, they invade Java, and they, they, they fought for about uh, four months until the, the Franco-Dutch forces surrendered, and by this time they were in central Java, and Raffles was named lieutenant governor. The governor, of course, was Lord Minto back in India. That's why he's only called lieutenant. Um, in 1812, Raffles was traveling around and looking for other allies. He, he went to Aceh. He doesn't mention seeing these very beautiful structures, but maybe it's because they're in what used to be the old Ache Palace, and they're still there. And he received the Order of the Golden Sword from the Sultan, Jawhar al Alam Shah of Ache. And of course, later on, after writing, after having you know, writing, written the history of Java, he became Sir Stafford Raffles. He got a coat of arms, and he put the Golden Sword, the crease, on his coat of arms. <laughs> so it's there. That's the Ache crease and he got an Arabic inscription also. So he was actually quite uh, enamored of all things having to do with Malay, including uh, Chinese culture. So that's the Raffles family, but of course he had no descendants. So he didn't get passed on to anyone. Now one of the more interesting curios is this elephant which Raffles sent to Japan. Raffles was interested in Japan, he never went there, of course. But of course, the Dutch had a base in Nagasaki or on a little island off Nagasaki. And that was the only European trading group for a while to be in, in Japan in the 1800s. And so Raffles, this comet came under Raffles because he took over the rule of the, the governor of Java. And so Nagasaki was part of his domain. And so he was actually interested in the, 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 the potential of trade with Japan. And when he went back to London, he actually had three cases of Japanese artifacts, which he must have gotten someone to bring him back from Japan. He had porcelain cups and wooden masks, and the only things in the British Museum uh, which remain of that collection are the masks, but they're still there. Um, so he sent several ships to Japan um, with uh, things from Java and Sumatra, but he told the crew to pretend to be American, because apparently that was more acceptable to the Japanese than being British at that time. And the elephant was one of the things he sent as a present to the shogun. And the, the Japanese were fascinated, and of course they made this drawing of it. But they were not allowed to land it. They couldn't bring a big ship into the harbor in Nagasaki. They couldn't figure out a way to get it onto a little rowboat. They had to take it back again. <laughs> so the Japanese came on board, painted a picture of it, and said, OK, take it home. And then the re I got onto Japan. And I went back to Java, and we don't hear any more about this. I Libya, 
made their first visit to central Java only after a couple of years, 1813, after they'd gotten all these reports from Cornelius and uh, the other Dutch officials and uh, also from Mackenzie and Harp and Harp Warfield. And they visited these places, Pramana and Borobudur. So this is a map of their, dra their travels in an overlap from Valtanzor, Bulbor, through this, all uh, down through the southern uh, mountains, and then up, of course, around Borobudur and Agala. They went down to Jogja eventually. That was their route. And as history of Java quotes extensively from the report of another captain, military man Baker, whom he assigned to uh, keep on surveying, because by this time Mackenzie had gone back to India. And, uh, and he, he says that uh, about Chandi Sari, for example, which is not one of the major tourist sites today, but it's in good condition, nothing can exceed the correctness and minute beauties of the sculpture throughout. Uh, he quotes his Indian sepoys, his Indian infantrymen, as saying, this is Captain Baker saying that they found them more beautiful than anything they'd seen in India. So the Indian uh, visitors were also quite impressed by the Javanese antiquities. And this is one of the, the drawings that was made at that time, one of these smaller temples, but very well depicted. And here we have Chandi Kalasan, another one which they visited, and they made these uh, elevations, and he quite elaborate sketches of them. And it uh, is quite accurate, as you can see from looking at the way it looks today. And here is one of the best preserved of these plaster uh, coatings. It's still on Chandi Kalasan. If you don't believe me, please go and see this one. And there is some traces of paint on it. It would have been a polychrome thing. It would have been looking like a Greek temple. Because, uh, except that, of course, the ancient Greek temples were all painted too. Uh, of course, Royfels maybe is best known archaeologically for having described Urubudur, having brought this to light. Prambanan had been known, and other temples around Georgia had been known to the Dutch, but they had never recorded Urubudur. Even, of course, the Javanese were aware of its existence, but the Dutch had never explored it. And so it was uh, during this period, uh, the, the Raffles period, when he was traveling around, that, the, from the Board of was first brought to notice, first recorded. This is Horsfield's drawing of it in 1814 that shows that it was not completely covered in volcanic ash. Some misconceptions have it that way, but it was had trees growing on it. But it was clearly um, visible as a man-made structure. And, but he only, if you read this history of Java, he only strangely devotes two pages to Board of It's quite short. Uh, and I suspect it's because you couldn't see much at that time. It's still, the galleries were all full of volcanic ash. And there were still trees growing on it. I suspect that's why he didn't say much about it. Um, but we do have these drawings, and the, again, the uh, East India, uh, for the, the Red British Museum's collection. Quite sketchy, but they're pretty accurate, just as outline drawings of what you can see in the murals at Wurundur. But he also went way up into the mountains. He explored mountains as often as he could. He went out to the Dien Plateau, and of course, this is a much more congenial area. And health wise, it was nice and cool. Um, European type climate way up here. And uh, it fascinated a lot of the, the Europeans because it had this large collection of early, very early Javanese architecture. At this time, the British recorded over 100 temples still standing, and now there are only about 10 between Raffles time and our time, a lot of the ones that are actually depicted in the Raffles um, drawings don't exist anymore. And Raffles drawings are the only record we have. In the uh, late 19th century, this is one of the early aerial photographs of the area. It's about 2,000 meters high, that plateau. Uh, the color lakes, all the beautiful features of it. Uh, this is uh, standing and looking. We did an excavation here at this site uh, two years ago with some funding both from uh, Science of Southeast Asian Studies, and um, also from one of my old students who donated some money to our institute and also Nanya Technological University. And um, we have some drawings in the Raffles book, History of Java, with some of the statuary from here. You can still see some of these. This one now minus the head. I think, I'm not sure whether this is the same one. It might be a different one. Same basic idea of Nandi and Shiva, but the, the Javanese didn't know about the Indian conventions for drawing Shiva and Nandi, so they made Nandi look like a human with a cow's head. And here, um, this may be the same one, or it might be a different one, because the legs are in a different posture. Um, but he found Dieng more interesting. Raffles 
mentions over 400, 400, not one number, 400 temples. And so he had Baker surveying the site for three weeks, made a lot of drawings of these buildings, many of which then vanished and never got studied again. So all we have, we don't even have a good plan, unfortunately. So Baker drew the individual sites and those a lot of the statuary, but they didn't actually make that whole plan, as far as I know. Maybe Ingrid will find one to do some more research there. And uh, one thing Raffles was also impressed with was how much gold was found around those temples. He was fascinated because he says during the Dutch period, a lot of the local residencies, the local districts there, paid their taxes to the Dutch in archaeological gold objects. And in my study of Javanese gold, there is a whole type that I could like call the Yang type, because there was a whole a specific style of gold working, lots of very elaborate rings associated with that area. Uh, some of them saw things like priests or ascetics, this one like here. That's obviously meant to be some kind of a priest or ascetic holding these Lone Tower books. Here we have the kind of Garuda and Vishnu and so on. Lots and lots of very large uh, and heavy, almost pure gold items from that region. And uh, then, okay, that was maybe the high point of Raffles' life, I have to say. That first trip of his around Central Java. Uh, the next year, things started to go downhill. And uh, never got much better, I'm afraid. Uh, 1814, his first wife, Olivia, died. And, and she was buried, uh, actually she's buried in Jakarta. But they made this very nice memorial to her, uh, where Raffles spent most of his time up near Bogor, Altenzor, without care, literally in Dutch. And that's the painting of her, her memorial, and not her tomb. Her tomb is actually, and this is still there. You go to Bullboard, the Botanical Gardens, you can see it. You can see the old residency where Raffles lived. That's where Sukarno spent most of his time also <coughs> when he was president. He lived up there. It still belongs to the Indonesian government, obviously. Very beautiful gardens and so forth. That's where the Dutch governors also spent a lot of their time. So there's Olivia's memorial, but her tomb was actually in Tanaba. There is the old European graveyard, which is a section of Jakarta, Fort on the Tanaba. Um, this is the base of her tomb, and this is the tomb stone, which is not very legible, I'm afraid. Um, the stone quality was not so good. It got rather eroded. But of course, right in front of her tomb is that of John Leyden, who was another one of Raffles' good friends, uh, but who died very shortly after he arrived in Java. But he made the first translation of the Malayan Hills into English, for example. That's recently been republished. And you can get it online through the National Library Board. So you can even download the whole Leyden version of the Malayan Hills. And um, so Leyden and uh, Olivia, two of Raffles' um, closest associates, buried side by side there. I just like to take pictures of early Americans. So we've got from New York here. And also was buried in the same site nearby. So Olivia died um, November 1814, the next year, Raffles, maybe partly in order, well, he knew that uh, by this time that Napoleon was probably on his way out and that he would probably have to give Java back to the Dutch. And also he was uh, still mourning for Olivia, so he took a second tour. And he went to Central and East Java this time. He went to see more sites such as Tandisuku, which had only recently been discovered you know, by um, by Martin Johnson, who was the resident, the British resident in Surakarta. And then he gives a very detailed account of Suhu, once more than he talked about Urudur in his history of Java. So this is a drawing of it. Uh, so it's, it's up on the slopes of Mount Wawu here. And uh, this is a, a drawing from the history of Java. Here's the way it looks today. Pretty much the same. That's the gateway down below.